Hey guys, how are you? Man? I am good. Um, you know, I'm. You know, when I found out I was doing this, I was pretty excited because you know, I was already, of course, familiar with your work with you know the Purge franchise and all that. Um, but this is admittedly a very different project for you, I guess, from what most people know. And um, I was really excited. I watched it twice actually in preparation for this. Oh, um, man, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm a I'm a sucker for a coming to age movie. I mean, they're so, <laughs> they're so easily like relatable, and you know, like you kind yeah. of you feel all those things that you've gone through it growing up. All exactly. The, all the angst, <laughs> and the pains, and all that. Um, but what made um, this is like really cool for me as someone who loves film is that it's a coming of age story that's tied to this love of cinema. And I guess right. in particular, this love for one particular movie, which is, you know, <laughs> in this case. Um, yeah. But it felt like a very, you know, personal story for you. And I was kind of wondering, like, how it kind of came about for you and if any of it was kind of based on kind of your life growing up um, as a young person. Absolutely. I know that it's kind of said in Island where you're from. So that's kind yeah. of kind of where the start of it's from but um yeah like any other things that might have been inspired by your life that kind of got translated into the film yeah dude yeah no no i'm, I'm like you dude anything any coming of age stories i love and this one for me you know i'm a movie fanatic i think like i'm looking at your your room right now and we, we have similar <laughs> posters on the wall so i think we come from the same uh ilk and uh yeah movies were my religion in a way cinema was my religion from a very very oddly very early age from like five on my parents said i became obsessed and so there was something, you know, I always wanted to do an homage to films and what they meant to me. And also the theater experience, the, the communal theater going experience. I, I feel that it's like, it is my church. It's, there's a sanctity to that, that I think is very important. And, and I'm afraid it's going away in front of us. And it terrifies me, right? As we know, you know, people That's like you. us in the business, we know the truth behind the numbers and what they really mean. And even yeah. before COVID, we were hearing all the, you know, the rumors of the demise of cinemas. So in a way, this is an homage and hopefully people will see it and say, yes, we need to get back to theaters. That's my grand hope, even though, you know, that's very, uh, very uh, lofty hope. But no, where it came from, dude, yeah, a lot of audio, autobiographical bits in there, meaning the macro, like meaning the big picture of it is completely autobiographical. I was a movie obsessed kid. They meant the world to me. They inspired me. They touched me. They made me look at the look at different cultures and understand different cultures in ways that teachers and books could never make me understand. And they were my view to the world from this kind of small part of New York I'm from. And there was something about, so the specificity in the movie being Rocky three, right. It's, it's very specific. And yet I hope at some point it becomes about all movies. That's why I, I, you've seen the movie twice dude. So you'll see. Very you'll definitely see I, think. Uh, I think you got, I think you really nailed that. It's a, I mean, you are using that movie as an example, but I think it's that universal feeling of right having like whatever film it is, like that, that, having that communal experience, also having that, that emotional cathartic experience of like seeing something that means so much to you. Right, right, exactly. Hearing that with your family and your friends and like, you know, yeah. you know, that's, you're using that one movie as an example, but you know, they can be used for anything really. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. I'm happy you saw that because there was a big, you know, we had a big editing issue, not issue, but I wrote in the script that you know what, like you've seen it twice, so you'll notice that I, I never show scenes from Rocky Three. I kind of keep the camera on the audience. And I was getting a lot of notes from various people in the process saying, including Sly himself, who I, who I screened the film for. Oh, He's awesome. like, James, show the movie more, you know, show show Rocky Three. Like, <laughs> and I was like, you know what, Sly's saying it, my producers are saying it, so let's do a cut where we show Rocky Three more, even though my instinct was to say, let's not do that. So we did it and dude, it changed everything. The scene became oddly more about Rocky Three, and you actually started wanting to watch more of Rocky Three. Right. So the narrative focus shift away from the audience and their emotion. So yeah, that was the whole. My always the intent was yes, it's the specificity of Rocky Three, but I'm so happy that you felt that at some point it was more of a universality of any cinema can be replaced. You know, any movie can be put up on that screen. So yeah, it was really my love of film that inspired everything and how much they meant to me, and then. All the little details, we did wait three and a half hours online to see Rocky Three. There was something about Stallone, I will say this. My tip of Staten Island, the South George Staten Island, is very Italian-American. And I always attributed it to that, that we did, as they say in the movie, we did adopt Stallone as kind of our god and savior, not only as Rocky, but as Rambo. So when those movies opened yeah. here, it was, a, it was a big, <laughs> uh, very big experience. We wait online. It was an event. And right. even the event of it, again, I hope doesn't play just as Rocky Three. the event of movies of what they used to be. Right. And I'm so afraid that they're losing that kind of status. I know Marvel still has that feeling of event. I hope it goes beyond that again. Someday yeah. we, you know, 
Yeah, I was yeah, I was thinking about it too. I was watching it because you know you, it's funny that you brought up Marvel because I guess that's the only kind of thing that we have now that kind of feels like that whole big group uh, right communal experience of going to the movies. But even even going into something like that feels different because it kind of uh, it's this kind of like you like there's no waiting around the block anymore for the movies anymore. Right. You know? Uh, they're right. like you depicted that in the film, like that kind of like wait, wait, waiting around in a long line around the movie theater, like exactly. Either like you have everything is so rigid, you have your assigned seating, you have to like you're, you're picking everything before you even get there. Exactly, and, dude. Like, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that kind of is gone, and like, I kind of miss that. Uh, that kind Absolutely. of experience of like going to the movies because you don't really have that anymore. I mean, even though you can kind of oh. feel the energy of being in a packed theater. It's also everything that leads up to that. It's like, you know, that. Absolutely, dude. Like, I say that all the time. I think it's yeah. not just sitting in a packed theater. It's what created the event was the drive, you know, traffic, waiting in line, getting the newspaper to see where it was playing in that couple of theaters you had in town. And all that's kind of gone. All those like the, uh, the, the little peripheral things that added to the experience. You know, yeah, you, like you said, Marvel still packs the house, but it doesn't have the added, like, let's wait online for two. No one waits online. I think for a movie anymore, we don't have to, right? We go online, we get our oh, ticket. Go on our, go on our phones, go on the computers, pick your seat. Exactly. And you're, and you're there, yeah. Exactly. Definitely. And not. listen, and, and, and even worse is, you know, trying to replicate, and we've all done it, I've done it. I've tried to build like a nice screen at home. You can't replicate it at home. And that's what scares me even more. You can't replicate the experience. Yep. Phones ringing, food, whatever it is. So yeah. listen, man, it's a weird time for people like you and I who love it. It's, we, we got to pray that there's some kind of change in the zeitgeist that people want to return and not just watch Marvel films and theaters, but watch everything. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really hoping for that, too. I mean, like, the one, the scene that really, like, stood out to me, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it did in the movie, but I really loved, even without you showing any scenes from Rocky Three, just kind of keeping yeah. the camera on the audience and them reacting to different moments that, if you've seen Rocky Three too, that you know what moments they're reacting to. Dude, exactly, like, that's what I was hoping, yeah. I felt that, like, watching it. I felt that kind of, like, great. I know exactly what they're reacting to. I know exactly what death they're reacting to i know exactly what exciting moment they're reacting to because oh, dude. you know that means like, so much man <laughs> that like just keeping the camera on the different cast members different audience members i think that that for me was like you know this is why we love movies this is why we like yeah. going to the movie theater it's that communal experience of not just going with your friends but you're sharing that experience with strangers it's not just exactly people exactly you know. and like i really hope that doesn't go away i know that's kind of been the issue in the last year yeah, you absolutely. Know, especially with you know like oh it's theatrical dying because streaming's taking over people are yep. stuff at home but i can't get that at home like no matter how big oh, my TV is how good i get it same here dude yeah it's i got one of those 110 inch i got the 110 inch or you know screen kind of thing front projection looks gorgeous i just it's not even close to the experience of well, yeah, me looking over at you after a crazy moment in a horror film you know we just don't get that that's just not at home so yeah. yeah, man, it's weird. It's uh, we gotta we gotta pray for a change in the future. I'm definitely hoping for one. Um, so I wanted to talk to you. How did the cast kind of come together? Like, I know with Frank Grillo, you know, I've you worked with him before, but um, yeah. how did like you know you got Naomi Watts, you got him, uh, really stack cast and you know really good adult actors, and then you have some of the younger performers who I regrettably hadn't seen in anything. Uh, before, Neither. They were very, Neither did I. <laughs> very, very yeah. talented as well. I was like, you know, just really bought them in all their roles. So I was just wondering how did the cast were kind of top to bottom? How did they sure. come together for you? Yeah, dude, it was a, it was a, it was a process. You know, we made a, you know, worked with uh, Jason Blum at Blumhouse and my longtime producer, Sebastian Lemercier, uh, who's we have a, a, a company together. He's produced everything I've written in the last ten years, fifteen years, I should say. And uh, we made a deal when we got the movie greenlit. Uh, we said, let's not move forward until we find the right three boys. So that took some time, to cut, completely honest. I'm, I had never seen them before at all. And um, we just kept, we just, you know, we just kept pounding the pavement trying to find these boys because I didn't want to, the, the other thing I want, I didn't want to do, and this is a personal thing. I didn't want to play into some of the Staten Island cliches. Staten right. Island's got a specific kind of over the top cliche, Italian American talks a certain way. I wanted to kind of bring that down a level to make it a little less provincial. Right. maybe more universal story 
Nice. So not the heavy accented boys. So I found boys who I think could be in Staten Island, but not that cliched version of Staten Island. So we found the boys, everybody was happy. And then we said, okay, what are we going to do? I always wanted Frank. It was weird. Everybody wanted Grillo to play the mob star. I was like, no, no, no. I think it's more interesting so to take. used to him being like. That, exactly. Like that, that <laughs> exactly. He's that guy, guy right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm like, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because like so, one of my favorite things that he's done is not even as like a tough guy. He's in this movie called Disconnect that he's amazing. yeah disconnect dude yes he played yeah. the dad yes yeah, he's yes. The dad in that, and he's amazing in it uh it's probably like my favorite frank grillo performance ever because you know it's wonderful like he's i love wonderful. me i love everyone loves frank grillo being a badass like no one like we won't yeah, exactly that. like you've been <laughs> exactly. a badass in several movies already so yes like, perfect absolutely but, like, i love it too <laughs> people, watch people like him pull it back and you know just be like you know they can be restrained they can be like the, exactly yeah and like that was kind of nice to see i'm glad that you went that direction with him no, thank you, man. Yeah, and you know, people fought me on it as as happens, but we pushed, and I think Frank was open to showing something different. And I liked seeing, you know, he's hyper masculine guy, which represents very much the world I grew up in. This very hyper masculine, you know, culture here. But then I loved seeing how vulnerable he got at the end, and we did that little arc with him. I thought so that that was that fell into place nicely. And Frank was game; he wanted to do it. And then I just had someone gave me a list of, you know, you get these lists from your casting directors, right. and I was just I literally said, well, my favorite person on this list, hands down, even though I know it's a million to one shot, is Naomi. Mm -hmm. I've loved Naomi since I saw her in Mulholland Drive. I think it was the first thing I was blown away with, you know. So I said, let's just try Naomi. And Jason knew her. He's like, oh, let me send her an email, send her a script, and it was the weirdest thing. She loved the script. We met in New York, and uh, we hit it off, and. She was the best actor I've ever worked with in my life that I literally didn't have to do anything. Like it, it, she just did so perfect. I gave no notes, I think. So, so that came together. And then Bobby, Bobby, I love the idea of Bobby playing a mobster. I think he had done it all. I hadn't seen it, but I think he did it on Boardwalk Empire, someone told yeah. me. And this was pre-Irishman. So I hadn't seen his work in the Irishman. But I didn't want, again, I wanted to fight the, you know, a lot of guys have played mobsters many times, as you know, we've seen it over and over again. There was something fresh about Bobby something different. I know Bobby would also bring a little humor to it, something a little off center. Uh, so Bobby came in, he was a big fan of Rocky three. He grew up in a similar, I guess, New York world that I grew up in and he got it. So dude, it came together. It came together, I think nicely at that point. And uh, we got lucky, incredibly lucky. So. Yeah. I mean, it's a really good, I mean, just speaking on Naomi Watts, um, I was really kind of captured by like the humanity she brought to that role, you know, particularly yeah. with, you know, like her interaction with, you know, her other son with Christian, like sure, that sure. stuff, like, cause that, that storyline could easily just be like shoehorned in and kind of like not given the justice it deserves. But I really thought that the, that like the stuff with her and her son and like him kind of struggling with his own, like, like identity and all that, like sure. you actually really gave that, there's like oh, some thanks. authenticity to it that I thought was really poignant and really worked. And I really resonated. I thought it was like really oh. well done. Um, Thank you, man. That means a lot. That means a lot to it. Really, we put a lot into it. We did a lot of, we did a little work together on the script and just sitting down, talking about it, talking about what it meant in 1982 versus what it means now in this, you know, the, the, the culture now of the Me Too movement, what it meant back then, and the toxic culture of masculinity, all that stuff. We a lot of research and talk, a lot of talking yeah. amongst the cast. I think hopefully, I'm happy you say it's an incredibly delicate, sensitive subject matter. So we wanted to treat it properly. Yeah, it is, you know, because, you know, I, you know, of course, I was born in 84. So, I mean, of course, I didn't know about, you know, kind of what life was like then, especially, cool. especially um, for people struggling with all that. And, you know, I was wondering what it was like for you to write it, um, kind of like, did you have personal experience with it? Like, you know, like when it came to like writing that part of the story and then, Absolutely. Yeah, and then yeah, working yeah. with the actors, you know, what was it like, you know, kind of developing that arc with, you know, the both of them? Dude, it was interesting. So I, it's based on, and I don't want to, I'm not going to give names. That would be absolutely awful, but it was based on, there was a friend I grew up with here on the Island who struggled with his sexual identity in a world where that was, he spoke to me about it. I think I was the only person for a very long time because it just wasn't something that was even spoken about in any, in, in maybe the most secret corners of this place. It's a tough, I'm not saying what, these are the tough streets of New York, but it is a, it's quite a hyper-masculine culture as portrayed in certain films. It's kind of true. I always say my childhood was stand by me meets good fellows. Like that's the world it was. So yes. it was kind of a tough, <laughs> it was a weird combination, but it was a, it was a tough world and to struggle with it at that time. So I always, his story, his story, his life, and eventually what he became and coming out always stayed with me. We remained friends over the years and I always wanted to portray it in a film. I got his good blessing to do that here. Oh, that's really cool. And he liked that I was doing it in the trappings of, 
the inspiration of the film because Rocky actually meant a lot to him too. It's right. not what inspired him to, to face these challenges in life, but it meant a lot to him anyway. So I thought putting it in the trappings of how art can inspire us to do things and face our fears. So yeah, so there was this basis I had, this foundation, and it was about the time and place I thought and facing this very masculine dad, this face-off who represented a lot of dads that I grew up with around me, not just my own father. Luckily, my father was a very open-minded man. So, but around me was not, there was not the most liberal-minded, most open-minded people at the time. Understandably, it was a different culture then. Right. Uh, and it was just a different world. So anyway, yeah, but we really wanted to treat it. I'm happy you say you felt the, the sensitivity we put into it because I think Naomi specifically and Jonah, hopefully with my guidance, we, we really walked, we were walking a tightrope and we, did, we wanted to treat it fairly. And, yeah, uh, I mean, I, and there was, you know, there was a lot of realism there. I mean, I like that, you know, like, of course, it's awkward for both of them, right? Like she, she's known this for so long, and she's trying to figure out how do I like, broach this subject with him. And he is just so conflicted with the fact that, oh, wow, she actually knows, but I don't want to write on that, you know, like, anything's going on. And I also thought it was really cool, like when they finally had the talk where like, he was kind of like, okay, I'm admitting this. And when it got to the point of like, you know, this, does dad know? And she was like, no, 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 no. no. I mean, that's, that's, that's fairly realistic, right? Like, like he may not be as aware as she is. Like she's a little bit more keen to like knowing what might be going on with her son because one, like the dad is also dealing with his own stuff as well. As exactly. As as, like trying to take care yeah. of and everything. But I just, you know, I just really thought that like, you know, like I said, like, yeah, and it didn't feel like kind of shoehorned in. It was just so part of the oh, story. Great. I was like really, really, oh, really thank cool. You. To that means a lot. Thank you, bro. Thank you, man. Um, I mean, I am curious though, because like we, you know, we were talking about like using Rocky as like the or Rocky Three as like the movie that kind of, kind of, I guess, inspires people to like kind of take chances and uh, kind of identify with themselves more and all that stuff. Was there any when you were developing it? Was Rocky Three always going to be? the movie that was being represented here or did you think of anything else that for me it was it was weird to bring that up so it was always it was always rocky to me i did at some point in the process it was always rocky to me because i think rocky was so monumental in this kind of culture i felt like it would and it was a big movie around the world I meaning it wasn't just a specific thing to me it, it was obviously as we know one of the big franchises of all time so for me it was oddly always rocky and then um then at some point we were very afraid legal at legal got involved in the process and said we didn't they didn't know if they could clear rocky's image or or for the film and we got very worried i'm like well i need to show the poster so though there it was posed to me from the higher ups because they liked the script like can you substitute the film right and i remember giving it a thought of like other movies that were big such as the godfather in the in the environment of staten island and nothing had that kind of Maybe. That, that inspirational, I mean, the Karate Kid someone brought up, which then Cobra Kai came out right after that. So it was, uh, it was pretty much from my standpoint locked in until that legal question, but I couldn't, luckily we cleared it and I was able to make the film, but it was a, it was a talk, it was a talk at some point. And, um, you know, of course, you know, you've worked with Blumhouse before, um, when it kind of came to this, um, were they kind of like, okay, we're going to give you kind of like the freedom that you need to make the movie that you want because they've had kind of past success with you, even though it is different from what you've delivered to them in the past? Yeah, listen, that's what Jason, Jason's amazing. I mean, I've known Jason now for 20 years before he was, you know, Jason Blum. I knew him when he was just leaving Miramax and struggling. I don't want to say struggling, but he was a young producer. I was a young writer. And uh, yeah, so we've known each other. We have this trust. And then the purge, we got even closer. Our relationship got closer. Yeah, I think, dude, I handed him the script. And he's very honest. I've handed him all the scripts where he's like, I don't see it. I don't think I could get this going. This one, I think, touched him emotionally. So he was able to say, okay, I can get behind this. And it's not your typical universal film. They're not really making films like this right now. And they'll be the first to admit that. So, but I think Jason, the success of The Purge, I always say like, I have sometimes have purge fatigue, but I can't ever get mad at it because it let, it let me make a personal film, which I know is yeah. a privilege to do in this crazy business we're in. So yeah, so Jason's support really, I think, pushed it through what would have otherwise been an incredibly difficult he made that much smoother and he hid from me if it was very difficult for him to get the money he's very good at hiding that from the creative side he really <laughs> yeah, he's like don't worry about it. I'll handle it. I'll handle yeah it. i got it. i'll take care of it he's, a, like, he's just, like the old producer you just worry about doing the movie and i'll <laughs> yeah just make a good movie leave me i'll do the other parts yeah, yeah. <laughs> um you know like um like we spoke on before and i kind of want to touch on it a little bit more you know because this movie talks about that communal experience of like 
enjoying films together um, at the yeah. movies. And I know you kind of mentioned too that like even before the pandemic and the lockdowns, like there was just kind of like this shift towards uh, the theatrical experience not being as important. Like you can, oh, why do this for, why pay this much money to go to the movies when I can do the same thing at home? Absolutely, um, yep. Like just, like just looking at like, I guess I'm just looking too at like the recent like box office stuff too, the last like three or four weeks, the movies that have done well in the last three or four weeks have been movies that have been released exclusively to movie theaters. They're not like, they're respecting like the theatrical window. They're not also yes. being viewed at home. Um, so there's like this positive sign of like they're opening well, they're doing well. People still want right. to like, do you think that like there is like the fan base for people that want to go to the movies is still there and it's not something that is really dying out. Like it's something that should be continue to be nurtured and it's not completely going away just yet. Or will it ever go away? I hope it never goes away, but I don't I hope it listen, my hopeful side prays, you know, to the cinema gods that what you're saying is absolutely true that there are seeds of seeds of potential like uh comeback for the for the audience and you're right we're seeing stuff like it looks like the ones that are being released also on hbo max are not doing as well i was very surprised at suicide squad and even james wan's film the the malignant yeah. not doing well people have them at home and maybe that access is hurting maybe the studios will see my hope is that that the experience the cinema experience is not just relegated to horror even though i'm a horror fanatic horror yeah. and marvel i hope that it I hope that those mid-level dramas that we all like, something like a Rocky or even in terms of Indian, these movies that I grew up with, I hope that they can still stay in theaters and not be relegated to the streamers. That's what I'm worried about. I think we'll still see Marvel. We'll see Avatar, obviously. We'll still see Star Wars. Right. All these like big budget movies. All the big budget. We'll see horror because I think the horror fan base wants to, the horror fan base is great because they want the communal experience, I think, right? They still, I think you yeah. and I are horror guys. You know, they, we that, love being like, in the crowd, feeling, right? Feeling like scared and, and like, yeah. Being in the mood, like crying movie. Yeah. I mean, as, I mean, like even, you know, like, you know, Quiet Place Part Two did really well. Uh, you right. Know, Forever Purge did well too, like, you know, over the summer, like, there is, like, that that genre, I, I feel like, has kind of been gimmick yeah. proof a, li a little bit, where it's like, I think the demographic really wants to go to the Yes, movie. absolutely do, yeah, it's the younger demographic, we got to get the older demographic, and we got to get the youngsters to go to, hopefully, maybe different kinds of films, Please. Yeah, like, I love to see the return of the action film, I feel like the action film's been going away a little bit, I'd love to, that's what I grew up with, with the Schwarzeneggers and Stallones, and so, you know, we see that a little, like we have, you know, every once in a while, something like the Equalizer will bust through, but you don't see many of them busting through the original, right. not that the Equalizer is original, it was a brand before that. But anyway, you see, yeah, I hope that it's, I, that's my fear is that it's got to break out beyond Marvel, Star Wars and horror. And we got to be able to make other yeah, things. I mean, movies. like, it, yeah. you know, like, like when I hear about stuff like, you know, the Netflix deal for like the Knives Out sequels, which is good for the people involved, right? There's a lot of money being made. Yeah, yeah. I get it. But I, you know, I saw Knives Out on opening night at a right, yeah. crowded uh, showing for it. And it was a cool thing to see in the movie theater. Hey, right, I, I agree, like, dude, yeah. It's also one of those like mid-tier budget movies where they're like, well, doesn't necessarily need a theatrical release. So like, we could like exactly. kind of shoot it towards like, I, I kind of hate that that's the outlook now. And like, you oh. know, even looking at like a film like yours, like, like watching, you know, this particular film, it's just like, I would still want to see that on the big screen. And, you know, of course, later I would love to yeah. enjoy and watch it at home. But right, right, I right. Think that like moviegoers, I think every type of genre needs to be represented on the big screen. Like, absolutely, really, dude, absolutely. I really we need. <laughs> hope that like more people like, you know, because I guess what we're seeing is like the older demographic right now too is still a little leery about going out to the movies. Exactly, and, exactly. Like, and you can see that when like some of the older skewer movies not performing as well, and ones mm -hmm. that are like going a bit younger are doing better. Um, but I just really hope it changes. Like it, it, it's you know, I've, of course, talking to you is something that you love. It's something that I love. Oh, oh, and every, I only talk about it is my producer. We talk about it all the. Yeah, and he's been going out to LA to the LA theaters are a little crowded. He says they're getting a little better, and you can see, I hope that spreads, man. We got to keep, we got to keep our fingers crossed, my friends. To the cinema gods, they they Thank shine you. down upon us. <laughs> well, I want to show you a little something. Really quick. I'm gonna show you. We got we got to wrap it up, guys. So just yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. okay. It's the last thing I got for you. So this actually arrived in the mail right before I started this interview. 
Oh my God, dude, nice. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, I, awesome. like I, said, I know we're wrapping it up. Um, yeah, you. Uh, this was one of the movies that actually kind of braved the whole being released. Yes, dude, we did. You know, I in know. That kind of climate. I think it performed well, all things considered, considering it wasn't, everything wasn't fully back to where it was. Right, um, right. Um, I kind of quickly wanted to ask you, I know that like before this came out, they had talked about this being the last one. And then when you were promoting it, you're like, well, you know, I kind of have another idea for maybe another story. Like, do, is that something that you still want to do? Like, do you want to continue the franchise? And uh, do you think you'll have an opportunity? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if the opportunity will be that. I'll say this. I, so I woke up about eight months. If you asked me that eight months ago, I would have definitively, as I've said many times, definitively said, no way, no more Purge films. The end of America happened at the Forever Purge. It's over. And then I woke up, uh, God, eight months ago when I had this idea. I pitched it to Sebastian, Jason, and they were both oddly like almost mad at me going, oh my God, we got to do that. You stink. It was still doing the Purge. <laughs> so it was a fun idea. It was, I think, an interesting way to flip the franchise. Yeah. So I wrote it. I actually, the studio liked it. They, I wrote part six. Part six is written, but I don't know. I don't know. I haven't even showed it. I just finished it about a month ago. So we'll see what the studio wants. I always say like, if it, if the audience wants it and the studio wants it and the, you know, the gods of cinema, I keep referencing want it, it'll happen, but it's written. It's written. I'm, I'm happy about, it. I feel like it came, but it's the return of Frank Rillo's character. So, which is fun. Oh, we'll bring him back to be a badass. So <laughs> that's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah bringing gorilla back is fun it's a it's a new face of america we'd be entering into it's 10 years after forever purge so it's written can't say it hasn't been greenlit so we don't know what's going to happen i think because i think for the studio they're still accumulating the numbers and seeing right, what right. it all means uh i know peter kramer the, the, the president of production over there who we work with very closely loves the franchise so i think he wants it to continue so fingers crossed we get to do another one but i love the idea of returning of returning grillo to the franchise that's kind of fun well, no, uh, well, I hope you get to do that. Um, I, I just wish you, you know, continued success with Thank whatever you, projects that you're working on. I, I like from the Purge franchise to this, like you have like such a, I think, neglected writing and oh. directing style. So I really, Thank you. Means, that, that means a lot to you. have coming up next. Thank and you. I really hope people check out this film. Uh, we'll make sure to point them all in the right direction so they see it. It's really solid and um, should be really proud of it. It's really good. Thank you so much, man. That means so much. Great interview. Thank you so thank much. You so thank much, you so much, man. for giving me your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. Bye, yeah. man. Have a great week. It's finally here. Rocky 3 opens today. Anthony, you get the tickets to Rocky 3 before it gets sold out. I got sunshine. Yo, Adrian. Your people have adopted Rocky Balboa as the new God and Savior. No. You're not here to see Rocky, are you? You're not made for Rocky. Rocky's made for guys like me. The thing is about you and your relationship with one and only. Oh my God, so oh, Tony! Hey, do you remember we saw Rocky one together here with her dad? Yeah. Rocky always reminds me of you. Dirty! Stay in Rocky, all right? Santa! Get out of here! Yeah. These are characters, heroes, who inspire us to be courageous. I'm going to Sophie Sweet 16 to tell her happy birthday, to tell her I love her. We're in the air tonight, guys. Summer of 1982. Everybody's going bananas. I got so much energy, I don't know what to do with it. Me too. What a movie, man. Toughest to always win. Nah, Frank. You have the biggest heart wins. We never think we're good enough. We're always getting pushed around because we're afraid. Afraid of what people would think, what, what they'd say. I don't want to be afraid anymore. Is this not the greatest night of all time, or what?